Now the teaching given by the Buddha in the first noble truth often tends to arouse a certain degree of emotional resistance. This gives rise to misunderstandings, sometimes to false charges, the Buddhas, the pessimists, the negativists, one who sees only the dark side of things. However, we have to understand the Buddha's purpose and intention in teaching the first noble truth. The Buddha's aim in his whole Dhamma is to lead us to liberation to lead us out of an unsatisfactory situation. And the way to liberation lies through correct knowledge, through seeing and understanding our existence as it is. In coming to the Dhamma, we have to come with an open mind, ready to look at things objectively, to see them as they are, yatha bhutang jnana knowing and seeing things as they are. And this calls for some effort, and sometimes it involves some amount of internal friction. Our usual way of seeing things, of interpreting our existence, is largely determined by our desires. We tend to notice things, to conceive and interpret our experience, in ways that are dictated by our desires, in ways that confirm our preconcept, that confirm our preconception. And thus we blot out things we don't want to see. And we take note of the appearances of those things we want to see. On a larger scale, we put the old people off into homes for the aged. We don't want to see old age. The sick people are put off into hospitals. And if we have to go to the hospital, we go reluctantly. The dead are embalmed and covered over with nice flowers and put to <laughs> very nice tombs. Poverty and war we shut off into little corners of our mind. We sit comfortably, looking at nice, pleasant, cozy, comfortable things. We're driven basically by an innate desire for pleasure, by a love of life. And so any teaching that tends to call these urges into question arouses some degree of inner opposition. The mind makes use of its intelligence in clever ways. It uses ploys to justify its attachment. It's clinging to its pleasures to justify its own neat little picture of the world. And so we set up thick emotional screens around our mental eyes so that we see and conceive and understand things in ways that are governed by our desires, in ways that turn back and reinforce our desires, that validate them, give them the seal of approval let them go scot-free. But the approach required in understanding the Dhamma is quite different. The Buddha says that the Dhamma is patisotagamani, that it goes against the stream of our ordinary inclinations. But the Dhamma is the truth of our existence, the real nature of things. And to understand the truth of our existence, we have to be prepared to look at existence as it is. The Buddha doesn't aim at making us gloomy pessimists, quite the contrary. But he also isn't going out to, to console us with false comfort. The Buddha's aim is to awaken us, to make us seers of truth, seers of that which is. For it is only seeing, seeing rightly, that leads to freedom. And to become seers of that which is, we have to stop seeing what we want to see. 
we have to undergo a kind of process of unlearning to remove the screen of prejudices and pre-established views. It requires an ability to sit down, to take a good long look at our existence in order to understand it correctly, free from all preconceptions as to how we want it to appear. And the Buddha holds that to gain a complete view of our existence, we have to look at it from three angles to see it in terms of three aspects it presents. One is the aspect of a sada, which means enjoyment or satisfaction. The second is the aspect of adinava, danger or unsatisfactoriness. The third is the aspect of nisarana, release or escape. In viewing our lives from these three angles, the Buddha points out firstly that life involves a sadha, it involves pleasure and enjoyment. He says that if there was no enjoyment in the world, in our belongings, in our achievements and activities and personal relationships and so on, people wouldn't become attached to the world. But it's precisely because there is enjoyment in the world that people become attached to it. And not all of these enjoyments are wrong or unwholesome. The Buddha never says this. Many can be worthy and many deeply rewarding. The happiness of a good family life, of friendship, of true love, of aesthetic pleasures, of religious life. But the Buddha points out that existence also has to be looked at from another angle. This is the angle of Adinava, the unsatisfactoriness, the inadequacy. And this inadequacy consists in the fact that all our experience, including our pleasures and joys, is impermanent. Everything is subject to change, and in many ways, at a deep level, it can be connected with pain and with dissatisfaction. Then the third angle the Buddha indicates is the aspect of release, the sarana, to be free from suffering, we have to put away the attachment and desire for the objects of enjoyment. Since, since it is this attachment that leads us into the pain and suffering. But still the question might be asked, if life involves both enjoyment and disappointment, both happiness and suffering, why does the Buddha put so much stress on the negative side? Why is he so much concerned with showing up the aspect of dukkha rather than acknowledging both pleasure and suffering equally? To understand why the Buddha makes the problem of dukkha the theme of his teaching, we have to understand the intention behind his formulation of the doctrine. The Buddha's thought really begins not with the truth of dukkha, but with something more fundamental. This fundamental starting point is the fact that all living beings seek happiness. The most basic and universal urge of all life is the urge for happiness. But when we inquire into the nature of the happiness we seek, we find that it is a state free from suffering, an experience that's associated with suffering, that's tied up in some way with pain, sorrow, worry, or dislike, can be pleasurable, enjoyable, but it can serve as a base for true happiness. And therefore we make a distinction between true happiness and seeming happiness, the illusion of happiness. True happiness is a state which is immune to suffering, a state that cannot be touched or corrupted by dukkha. And to find such a state we have to take the things we ordinarily consider to be sources of happiness and find out if they are really so, if they really can give us the happiness we want. 
a perfectly complete satisfaction free from any mixture with suffering. And if they cannot do so, if they should turn out to be connected with suffering or to lead into suffering, then we have to draw the conclusion that they're really dukkha, concealed forms of dukkha. Now if we reflect carefully, we'll see that a great part of our common experiences of pleasure and enjoyment is bound up in some way with pain that involves a subtle kind of dissatisfaction. This might not be evident at once, but it becomes clear when we reflect carefully. We use what the Buddha calls yoniso manasikara, wise consideration. Let's take the things we ordinarily turn to for happiness. What are these? Sense pleasures? The beauty and health of the body? Feelings of aesthetic enjoyment? Interpersonal relations? Most generally, life itself. The Buddha examines all of these sources of happiness in different places in the suttas. And he shows how they're all defective. How they fail to measure up to the criterion we set for true happiness. First take sense pleasures. Sense pleasures give some amount of happiness, but they're bound up with excitement and with agitation. When we enjoy them, we tend to grasp them, to clutch them, to try to draw from them whatever enjoyment they can give. And our enjoyment might be accompanied by anxiety and worry. We're afraid that the objects of pleasure will perish, be stolen, or lose their flavor. Or the people who give us pleasure will leave us. Or our enjoyment might be mixed with guilt when we enjoy them at the expense of someone else. The enjoyment leads to greater attachment. We cling even more tightly to the sources, to the sense enjoyment. We become more and more de dependent on them. We develop a kind of addiction to them. Then when the pleasurable objects or persons are lost, we feel sorrow and grief. And often we find that the pleasures that we've sought for, when we get them, they don't give us the happiness, all the happiness that we expected of them. Even when we get them, even when we're satiated with them, they still leave us feeling hollow, unfulfilled, discontent. Then we cling to the body when it's beautiful and healthy, we become proud of it and happy with it. But as time goes by, the body loses it, loses its beauty, its health. It grows old, it can fall sick, it becomes ugly. Then there comes sorrow. Aesthetic feelings, religious experiences, even meditative experiences, might give some kind of serene and detached happiness, but that's not permanent. Personal relationships, these can be deeply fulfilling, but again, they're not stable. Sometimes the personal feelings change. Sometimes friction breaks out, misunderstandings. Then this will be followed by parting and separation. And even when the relationships are fruitful and lasting, they still can't last forever. In the end, we have to be separated from everyone we love. Death comes breaks the connection. Then life itself, this is taken to be the ultimate good, the source of all our happiness. But let's take a close look at life, at our existence. And to reach a valid evaluation of existence, we have to go beyond our own standpoint. We have to look at life in general, sentient existence in general. We have to widen our mental horizons, to stretch our consciousness outwards, to cover all life, to see what is the degree, the amount of experience, pain and suffering in life.
From our own position of relative prosperity and security, the fact of suffering might not be very, um, very serious. It might seem remote, something maybe that we meet with only occasionally. But if we open our mental eyes, if we extend our sense of identity to all that live, we'll see that the suffering in the world is really very vast, very pervasive, sometimes very terrible. We have to think of the millions of people without enough food to eat, children going hungry, starving, undernourished, people without clothing and shelter, refugees and orphans, people afflicted with various diseases, lying in hospitals without adequate medical care, without hope of recovery. We have to think of the old people, lonely, neglected, despondent, dying too slowly. We have to think also of the people who might be healthy and well-nourished, but they're living in totalitarian countries with tyrannical governments, living filled with fear and distrust, unable to think freely and to express their thoughts freely. Also, we have to think of those who are caught in the net of violence and the destruction of war. Think of those, the victims of accidents, earthquakes, fires, floods. Think also of those who are well-off and successful and prosperous, living in free countries, but their lives are unfulfilled have no sense of purpose. To use Thoreau's words, the people who are living lives of quiet desperation. Then we have to think more widely even than the human world. Think of the animals as well. The wild animals living in a constant struggle for survival. The only rule is to devour or to be devoured, to kill or to be killed. We have to think also of the domestic animals living in their dullness, forced to work, driven by men to work, raised to be slaughtered and eaten. And then for all life, the ultimate end, as the Buddha's always already indicated, is old age, illness, and death. So that's the evaluation of life itself. From these reflections, we can see that things that we turn to for happiness do give us pleasure. They give a temporary gratification. But what they don't give us is a deep, lasting, complete sense of gratification. None is absolutely reliable. They change, they break up, they prove disappointing, they issue in more clinging. At the core, they're inadequate, unsatisfactory, and thus they turn out to be really forms of dukkha. Now it might be claimed that even though life has its share of suffering and disappointment, still it offers its opportunities for pleasure. Now we should grasp these as long as we have the chance. Even though things are impermanent, they have to change, still we can try to grasp as much enjoyment as we can. Just when one enjoyment goes, let go of it and choose another. That would be the philosophy of gather your rosebuds while you may. That might be a true principle if this were the only life that we live. But the Buddha teaches that this is not the only life. And to really get a complete picture of the full range of dukkha, to see dukkha in its fullest measure, we have to take account of one additional fact. One fact which will multiply the range of dukkha to infinity. And this is the fact of rebirth. 
The Buddha teaches that we do not live one time only, but many times, countless times. Our life is part of a succession of rebirths, a process of repeated existence that's been going on since beginningless time. This is samsara, the wheel of rebirths, the wheel of birth and death. One life succeeds another without any first point. Birth, growth, decay, and death, followed by more birth, growth, decay, and death. That is the pattern that's been repeating itself over and over, countless times without beginning. And the consequences of this teaching on samsara, the round of rebirth, consequences are very important. The Buddha himself makes the point in a group of suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya called the Anamataga Samhita, the collected sayings on the beginningless samsara. He says that countless times in our wandering through the round of births and deaths we've experienced the death of our parents, the death of brothers, of sisters, children and friends. Countless times we've met sorrow and grief, separated from the pleasant, united with the painful. We've wept and lamented and we've shed more tears than there's water in the great ocean. Life after life, crying and weeping, we shed more tears than the water in the ocean. As long as we go on, we're likely to meet the same forms of suffering over and over in the future. And we meet suffering in all the different planes of existence. In the course of our wandering through birth and death, we've inhabited all the different planes. The heavens, the lower worlds, the human realm, the animal realm. And many times we've experienced the dukkha of those planes. And our future is uncertain. Just a turn of the wheel, the transition from death to birth, separates us from rebirth into lands torn by poverty, by oppression, by war, or from rebirth into the lower worlds. And even life in the heaven is no con in the heavens is no consolation. For life in all the planes of existence comes to an end. And so when heavenly life comes to an end, will be followed by a reaper at some place else. We don't know where. So when we examine our lives in the light of the Buddha's teaching, it becomes clear that real happiness, true lasting happiness, cannot be found in the realm of the condition, in the realm of the world of birth and death. All conditioned things are transient. To find real happiness becomes necessary to turn away from all that is conditioned, from all that's subject to aging, to decay and death. But as we said before, the Buddha's teaching recognizes our most fundamental urge to be the urge for happiness. And the teaching is a doctrine of deliverance is intended to bring the fulfillment of that urge. But the Buddha teaches that real happiness, stable and perishable happiness, is to be found only in the unconditioned, that is, in the Nibbana, the deathless state. And that is the real import of the first noble truth, that to reach the state of perfect peace, of happiness free from suffering, we have to turn away from the conditioned formations, the five aggregates and to seek the unconditioned, the Bana. But to get free from the conditioned, we have to find the causes for our bondage. If we're tied up in knots, tied up by bonds, we have to find how the bonds are tied, what are the knots, in order to undo the knots. So this brings us to the second noble truth. The second noble truth is the truth 
of the origin of dukkha, dukkha samudaya arya satcha. And this truth aims at showing us the cause of suffering, the real cause of dukkha. Now, different philosophies and religions give us different answers to the question as to why we're subject to suffering. Some say that suffering occurs through chance or through purely naturalistic causes. Some say that it comes by fate or destiny. Still others attribute it to the will of an almighty God to inflict suffering on us as punishment for some original sin or as a means to purify us and make us worthy of his love. All these explanations the Buddha dismisses as fanciful, products of belief and imagination. They all (coughs) lead to one of two results. Either they encourage a passive acceptance of suffering, resignation, or else they get us involved in treating the symptoms. We see the first in the fatalists and in certain forms of theism, We see the second in the attempt of modern secularists to make our lives cozy and comfortable by all sorts of technological wonders. But the Buddha's approach to the problem of dukkha is quite different. The Buddha's approach is to trace the problem to its cause, to its root. It is said in the text that the Buddha is like a lion and the other philosophers are like a dog. If somebody throws a stone at a dog, the dog chases the stone. This is like the thinker who tries to stop dukkha by treating the symptoms. But if somebody throws a stone at a lion, the lion chases the person who threw it. That is like the Buddha, who tackles the problem of suffering by attacking the cause. And to deal with the cause is very essential. We can only eliminate dukkha by getting rid of the cause, by eradicating the cause. If we deal only with the symptoms, with the forms of dukkha, and leave the cause intact, then beneath the surface, beneath our comforts and pleasures, the volcano of suffering will continue to gather force and in time it's bound to erupt. So in the second noble truth, the Buddha points out the origin of dukkha. And the cause, he says, is craving. Pali Tanha. Let me read the Buddha's own words. What now is the noble truth of the origin of dukkha? It is craving, which gives rise to repeated existence, produces rebirth which is bound up with pleasure and lust and finds ever fresh delight now here, now there. It is of three kinds, sensual craving, craving for existence, and craving for annihilation. First, we have to deal with the word tanha. The word means literally thirst. We follow the common practice and translating it as craving. Some writers explain tanha as desire, but this translation can be misleading. It might suggest that Buddhism insists on eliminating all desire, which is false. The Buddha recognizes that desire is ambivalent. There can be good desires, the desire to practice the Dhamma, the desire to give, to observe precepts, the desire to help relieve the suffering of others, and so on. There can also be neutral desires, the desire to take a walk, the desire to sleep when tired or to eat when hungry. And there can also be unwholesome desires. It's the latter desires, the unwholesome ones, that are meant by craving or tanha. That is, desire grounded in ignorance and delusion, in the drive for personal gratification. The desire seeking pleasure, power, 
high status for oneself. And though craving is singled out as the cause of dukkha, it shouldn't be thought of as the only factor involved in the origination of suffering. Tanha is selected because it is the chief factor, the principal and the most pervasive factor. Craving is the active accumulated the active accumulator of dukkha, the factor which can be seen most clearly in the workings of our minds and the factor which has to be brought under control in treading the path. But craving always works in a whole complex of factors. It's conditioned by ignorance and by the psychophysical organism. It's directed towards feelings and it requires objects. It uses the psychophysical organism as its instrument. It issues in clinging and grasping and holding. It builds up formations which perpetuate dukkha. All of this becomes clear in the teaching of dependent arising that we'll explain in lecture number four. The Buddha says that craving takes three forms. The sensual craving, Kamatanha, craving for existence, bhavatanha, and craving for annihilation, vipavatanha. Sensual craving is desire for the five objects of sense pleasure. Craving for pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch sensations. Also for the enjoyable ideas, images, and so on based on those sense impressions. Then there's craving for existence, bhavatana. This is the desire for continued survival, the life urge, the drive to go on existing and to take on special forms, to become prominent, famous, and wealthy, to become this, to become that. When joined with the belief in a permanent self, the craving for existence issues in the desire for personal immortality. Then there's craving for annihilation, for non-existence, the wish for self-annihilation. This arises when the pain of life becomes so unbearable that one wishes to escape by annihilating oneself. Its most evident form is suicide, though it can also take on forms of self-destructive behavior. And now we have to see how craving originates dukkha. The causal role of craving can be seen at two levels. We can speak of a psychological level and then a universal or cosmic level. First, at the psychological level, we find that craving is the underlying root of unhappiness. Sorrow, grief, fear, worry, disappointment, all these can be re trace to the desire for personal gratification. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha says, from craving there arises sorrow, from craving there arises fear. Craving gives rise to sorrow when we're separated from the persons or things we're attached to, when our hopes are disappointed, when we meet with rejection, feel, fail to get the things we want. Craving also gives rise to fear, we become afraid of losing the things we've obtained, afraid they might be destroyed, afraid the people that we like might reject us, or that circumstances might separate us. There are several stages in the psychological process by which craving leads into dukkha. First of all, at the very moment craving arises, it brings along a certain feeling of dissatisfaction, a tension causing pain and unhappiness. This feeling is born from the contrast between one's present state of lack, oneself without the object, and the possibility of fulfillment, oneself in possession of the object. This is the suffering of lack. Then to get the object, we have to search for it and strive to acquire it. This is the dukkha of striving and seeking. Then once we get the object we want, then we have to protect it, to safeguard it, 
to make sure it doesn't get stolen, break up, perish. Thus our enjoyment of the object is accompanied by the suffering of protection. And then once the object breaks up or the loved one goes away, then there comes the suffering of loss, the suffering of deprivation. At a subtler psychological level, even when we get the objects we desire and can enjoy them freely, then if we examine our minds carefully, we find that simply yielding to desire doesn't bring deep satisfaction. It brings only a temporary gratification, which actually fuels the force of craving, so that craving arises more strongly in the future, with greater force and power than before. We need more pleasure, more money, more power, higher position. It becomes even more demanding, more insatiable. It's like a fire. We throw the wood under the fire. The fire subsides a little, then once the wood catches the flame, the fire blazes more intensely, burns stronger than before. In that way, craving brings an even stronger inner dissatisfaction or a compelling need to acquire a new object to fill the void. So that's the way craving becomes the origin of suffering at the psychological level. But then passing to a deeper level, we see a connection between craving and dukkha in that craving is the force which fuels the round of rebirth, samsara. The Buddha describes craving as pono bhavika, leading to repeated existence, to new rebirth. He also says that craving seeks the light now here and now there. As long as the body lives, the mind clings to it. And craving uses the body as its means for finding delight. At death, the body stops functioning so it can no longer support the stream of consciousness. But the craving remains, so when the link between the mind and the body is broken at death, then craving drives the current of consciousness on to a new body. It latches on to a new body as its physical form and brings about rebirth. Conception sets in, the embryo is formed, and the drive for existence continues in a new form with a new body as its support, renewing its search for pleasure and enjoyment. Therefore, the Buddha says that Craving, tanha, is the house builder. It builds up the whole house of samsara, all the forms of existence. And as long as the craving is unchecked, the wheel of rebirth continues to turn. It's like a leapfrog arrangement. Craving gives rise to new existence. New existence provides the base for craving. In this way, craving constructs the round of becoming it issues in Reaper. In that way, it originates the dukkha of the five aggregates, the psychophysical process, again and again. Now, in the third noble truth, the Buddha makes it known that this process of becoming doesn't have to continue indefinitely. He announces the cessation of dukkha. This is the dukkha nirodha arya satcha, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And this truth shatters the charge of pessimism and reveals the great affirmation of the Buddha, the affirmation that suffering can be totally overcome and that a state of perfect peace is open and available. Now the cessation of dukkha is arrived at simply by following through to its conclusion the logic of causality underlying the second noble truth. If craving is the origin of dukkha, then the key to putting an end to dukkha lies in eliminating craving. And so the cessation of dukkha is the complete cessation and elimination of craving. Now the cessation of suffering that comes with the end of craving, this can be understood at two levels. It's 
the psychological and metaphysical level, corresponding to what we said before about craving as the cause of suffering. First, at the psychological level, when craving is cut off, then all mental unhappiness comes to an end. The mind is utterly released from sorrow, worry, fear, and grief, and distress. But this is not a mere negative state, but corresponding to the end of Dukkha there comes the great peace, Mahashanti, the supreme happiness, complete joy. The liberated one, the Arahant, lives in perfect peace, always content, always serene and happy. He can still experience physical pain that comes through the body. He can still he can still fall sick and he has to grow old and die. But since his mind is released from all clinging, these cause him no disturbance. He goes through them without sorrow. His mind stands unshakable among all the vicissitudes of life. Then, with his death, the whole process of becoming comes to an end. Since he's abandoned craving, there's no seed for new existence. Sangsara, the round of rebirth, draws to a close. This is the state of final deliverance. But this end of dukkha, this is not annihilation, not a plunge into utter non-being, but simultaneously it's a full attainment of the unconditioned. Nibbana. The liberated one passes out from the world of becoming to a state which is immeasurable and inconceivable beyond the range of concepts and words. Thus the third noble truth, the cessation of dukkha, is the reality designated Nibbana. Then in the fourth noble truth, the Buddha points out the way to bring about the end of Dukkha, the path to reach Nibbana. That way is the noble eightfold path, which consists of the eight factors, right views, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is a practical course of treatment which can be applied to our life to overcome the problem of dukkha. So the fourth noble truth is the way to the cessation of suffering, the noble eightfold path. As we go along, we'll deal in much greater detail with the third and fourth noble truths. Here we just deal with them lightly. We'll deal with them more in later lectures. Now we conclude by explaining the functions to be performed with regard to each noble truth. For each of the four noble truths presents a challenge it imposes a particular task which the follower of the Dhamma has to take up and fulfill. The first noble truth, the truth of Dukkha, has to be fully understood. We have to understand the truth of our own existence, of our experience. And so the task imposed by this truth is full understanding, to understand our experience made up of the five aggregates. The second noble truth, tanha or craving, also imposes a task. That is abandonment. We have to abandon craving, the craving which originates suffering. Then the third noble truth, the truth of the cessation of suffering, nibbana, that is to be realized, to be attained. The task is the realization of nibbana. And then the fourth noble truth, the truth of the path, that is to be developed, practiced, and cultivated. By developing the path, we come to the full understanding of dukkha. By understanding dukkha, we abandon craving. And by abandoning craving, we realize nibbana, the end of dukkha. In this way, the development of the path is the key to fulfilling all four functions regarding the four noble truths.